Hello everybody. Today's comment shout out goes to Loli. Joe and Lori's relationship has nothing sexual about it. They were brother and sister. Even before he married Amy, it never made sense for them to marry. Even before Frederick got into the picture. Why are people so against Frederick marrying Joe? He was exactly what she needed. He was no consolation prize. He was older and she was more mature than the other girls her age. He loved children and teaching. So did she. He didn't care about worldly possessions. Neither did she. I could go on with this list. People love Jo, but they don't understand her at all. Also, it is sad that people don't believe in friendship between a man and a woman. End quote. You know, guys... I wrote an earlier intro to this episode. I like to write things by hand and then type them and record them. And I lost the draft that I wrote and I was really bummed because of that. So here is another try. When I think why people have problems with Friedrich, the first thing that comes into my mind is the complete misadaption and misinterpretation of the chapter Friend, which we will tackle in this episode. I invited Christina from the Joe and Friedrich blog to talk with me about this. One of the main problems in the films is that the filmmakers often make it seem that Friedrich somehow criticizes Joe's writing in the book. It is not Joe's story that he is criticizing. It is somebody else's. And Joe herself does not like the stories that she has produced. Narrator even says that Writing those stories caused her mental health problems, and she doesn't like sensationalism as a genre, and in the end she burns those stories. So when people like Reda Gerwig tell to millions of people in her interviews that Joe is some kind of a victim and Friedrich is a bully, it once again shows that she hasn't read the book, or if she has, she is lying to people about it, and she essentially is trying to make money by trying to frame Joe to be a martyr or a victim. But in the book, that was never the case. For me, this part in the chapter Friend, where Joe worked for this magazine and she struggled working there, always had a deeper meaning. Because for one, she did not believe to the agenda of this magazine. And second, the narrator says that doing the research for these stories gave her anxiety, so when Joe is working on this magazine, it has a very negative impact on her mental health. This was something that really resonated with me when I was in my 20s and I would reread Little Woman because I have worked in jobs that I did not enjoy and I'm not very proud of this. I was once in a school, this was during the time when I was studying to become an instructor In the first year, there were three people in my class who dropped out because they felt that some of the teachers were rude to them. And there were people in the class who did not get along. And I had this lady in my class who was in her 50s and she didn't know how to use a computer. Then we had a computer class and she asked me to help her. And the teacher started to shout at me. Apparently, I was interrupting her. And this lady who didn't know how to use computers she dropped out the school as well. So there was constantly this very negative atmosphere. And I felt that some teachers were pressuring me to stay there. And I did for a while. But the way they treated us just became worse. And eventually I had a mental breakdown and I dropped out as well. It might have been a record for that school how many people dropped out in one class. What happens to Joe is very relatable because... So if you go to school or if you are working in an environment where you are being treated very poorly, it can have a really big impact on your well-being and mental health and everyday life. When I read this chapter, I guess you could say that it was almost therapeutic for me because Joe wanted to leave that environment. She didn't know how and Friedrich kind of gave her the strength to do that. And it is so sad that there is not any Little Woman adaptation which would actually tell the real story, what happened, 
when Joe was working in the weekly volcano. They discovered the route. Friedrich didn't like Joe's writing, which was never the case. Friedrich likes Joe's writing, her poems, her realistic stories. And Joe doesn't even show him the sensational stuff because Joe herself is ashamed of them. I almost find it offensive that the movies and the TV shows don't tell that story. The story that actually happens in A Little Woman. And now Christina and I will tell you that story. A lot of you have requested that we would tackle this chapter. And I am very glad that we did. This is Little Woman Podcast, a show at the Sensational Stories. you here today because I think you have some of the best thoughts I have read about this chapter, the chapter friend, which is very much misunderstood in my opinion among a lot of people who say they know a little woman, especially filmmakers. I was just thinking that when I came across the name Dashwood and I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah I was just like, there it is. <laughs> no, there's that Mr. Dashwood who um Yes, and we will get into that. Why she doesn't like him. I think it's going to be a good discussion. So very happy in the social atmosphere about her, and very busy with the daily work that earned her bread, and made it sweeter for the effort. She still found time for literary labors. The purpose which now took possession of her was a natural one to a poor and ambitious girl, but the means she took gain her, and were not the best, she in her end were not the best. She saw that money conferred power, money and power, therefore, she resolved to have, not to be used for herself alone, but for those who she loved more than herself. The dream of filling home with comforts, giving Beth everything she wanted, from strawberries in winter to an organ in her bedroom, going abroad herself, and always having more than enough so that she might indulge in the luxury of charity, had been for years chose the most cherished castle in the air. Right here I see a parallel between Joe and Amy, because Joe takes sort of a wrong way to achieve her castle in the air, and then we have Amy who thinks about marrying a wealthy man just so she could support her family, and Joe does the same, but with writing sensationalism. And it's one of those things where people forget that she's not writing sensational stories because she firmly believes in it, but rather because she knows it's what's the end thing now and that's what's going to help give money to her family, which is what they're struggling with. I mean, even if it is something that you're just kind of like, and eh, about if it pays and in your mind it doesn't hurt anyone, then why not do it? This chapter, I actually think it's almost like a, an inner dialogue that Louisa May Alcott had because we know that she wrote sensational stories and um, I think she was quite ashamed of them at some point especially because she did not like the real life Mr. Dashwood uh, Frank Leslie and it's interesting because I feel like a lot of people have this experience when they are younger especially in the art fields so you work in a place that you are not 100% sure of, but because uh, you need some experience, you easily get exploited by these kind of magazines or BuzzFeed or <laughs> any kind of big company. Right, yes. It's like when you said that, all I can think of is the unpaid internship. They do all this work and running around and get bust their butts and take all the harsh criticisms and they don't even get paid, but it's all for the quote-unquote experience, but pretty much we all know that the experience won't fully be that as much as you actually get paid and, you know, have a position. People don't treat you as poorly as that. It's just really one of those things that I feel like this is one of the most probably 
it's a little sad that so many filmmakers entirely ignore this this part of the story because they just make it this big argument between Joe and Fritz, which is not in the book. I think it would make such a good social commentary into a little woman adaptation to show that this kind of things happen still today. Young people go and work in these big companies and free internships and they are like in the bottom of the <laughs> Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. Trash. Yeah, and they never discuss that. They never show that, really. I feel it's quite offensive towards Joe's character to say that she loved writing sensational stories when in the book she doesn't. I have a theory. <laughs> I was actually thinking about this 
You know how in the 1994 film, Laurie, when he proposes, he says that Joe doesn't need to write once they get married. And uh, it's also in the book when Joe says that, oh, he would not like her scribblings. But then I was thinking in the 2017 series and then in the 2019 film, I don't think they included the part where Laurie says to Joe that she doesn't need to write when they marry. And when I have read interviews from Greta Gerwig and Heidi Thomas, who wrote those versions, they both wanted Joe and Laurie to get there. But in both of these versions, there's this big argument between Joe and Friedrich about her writing. So could it be just Joe and Laurie shippers being biased? I, I think it might be. It's almost like they want to switch Friedrich and Laurie because, you know, in the 1933 and 1949 films, when, when Laurie proposes Joe, it is more of an, a fight, more of an argument. And then in these newest adaptations, it's not that much of an argument. It's like, oh, poor Laurie. <laughs> so they kind of switch this. They give this Joe and Laurie argument to Joe and Friedrich. And I don't know why. I think it's just because they're biased. Yeah, and, and, and it really does not make sense to any 
any of their characters, really, because Friedrich is typically a pretty gentle soul and definitely is able to properly articulate his own feelings uh, and thoughts, which is something that Joe kind of learns from him a little bit. Whereas Lori, particularly before Amy, when he meets up with Amy and Hero, is very much brash. I say what I'm feeling at the moment, and it doesn't matter if it hurts or, you know, if it makes sense. Yeah, to have that conflict between Joe and Friedrich, where Joe pretty much reverts back to her old temper, which almost by, at that point, she's managed it fairly well. I mean, you don't really see whether or not Joe excludes it from like, her letters to her family beforehand or not, but she's, I think, managed to handle her emotions fairly well at this point, because she is a 20-something-year-old lady, uh, not a 15-year-old. And I and I feel like, too, Friedrich is one of those people that has just a naturally calming presence. So I doubt very much that Joe, even when Friedrich is saying, you know, talking about the daily volcano, the weekly volcano, I keep saying daily. Um, I think one of the versions names is that. Even when he is talking about the weekly volcano, he's not, like, furious. He's not, like, screaming and losing his head. He is just, like, he just says, well, says with an air of great disgust. That's, he's not like screaming, he's not, you know, running around the room like a maniac and playing the papers. He just is like, ugh, this stuff again. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's the, that's the worst I think he really gets. So I don't know why you would have a, it, 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 and I feel like it looks bad on Joe when you have someone that is just like, eh, this isn't fun, this isn't very great, or, you know, it's not good for kids in a very calm manner and her to just be like, well, I like it, so screw you, like getting all mad and angry. And it's like all that development for her to go, oh, yeah, I need to learn how to control my temper and you're going to have her react that way. Like it's sort of a regression rather than a progression of her character. Yeah, and it diminishes her growth as a writer because when we are in this chapter, Joe already knows that writing is sensationalism. It's not, it's not good literature because she calls it trash. Right. And it's, I think it's a couple chapters before this when she wrote her first story and it became a flop. And that was because she wasn't really that good at having that self-criticism. Because she took, you know, the advice from Marmy, from her father, from Beth, from everyone in her family. And then she put all of that into this first novel. And that's why it wasn't successful. She didn't really know what, what kind of writer she was. She didn't really know how to sort of take the good from this story that she wrote. So I think this is such a good uh, chapter, how it describes Jo's journey as a writer. Because we can see her development, because she knows that, you know, she wants to keep these moral lessons, but the editor thinks they are not good, they don't sell well. And I think there is even a quote here where the narrator, like, says that, like, slyly, that, oh, the, the editor was wrong, the morals do sell. <laughs> family tell her like oh yeah this is good and and let's be honest family can be a little biased they you know they know like they can see that you have potential but they just you know they go oh that's so great like and not that that they're necessarily lying to your face either but they want you to succeed and they want you to have faith in yourself and they can play that they can be a little biased and you know it may be great to them because it's like Good job, Joe. That was wonderful. But really out there to, let's just say, a random stranger and just be like, it's all right. Like, so having someone like Friedrich who 
who knows her well enough to know what she's capable of, but isn't like so caught up in his emotions that like he can he's able to separate his feelings or her writings and go, all right, well this is good, but here's some criticism. And because she trusts him so well and likes him so much that she can take his criticisms with a good heart. Like right here, I'm quoting, she valued his esteem, she coveted his respect, she wanted to be worthy of his friendship, and just when that wish was sincerest, she came near to losing everything. And that's when it goes with the weekly volcano. But she she values what he says. I mean, she's the one that goes to him to say, would you mind reading my papers, like reading my stories? It's not him bugging her to read it or anything. And she shows what she thinks is the better of her work. And and that's why she takes his criticism to heart, because she knows that he's educated and that and we're worldly even. But ultimately it's because she respects him and values his opinion. He believes in her and wants her to do better that he gives her his copy of Shakespeare. Like, that's such a very intimate and thoughtful gift that the fact that he's like, I believe in you, and it's not just the lens, but here's a Christmas gift, here you go. Because I have that much faith in you. Like, that's very, that is so sweet, and that's so wonderful. And, yeah, I just, it's, again, one of those things where nobody, I think, really mentions at all in, in that regard of just how well she respects and values his opinion. Quote from Mr. Bear in one of their conversations had advised her to study simple, true, and lovely characters wherever she found them as good training for a writer. Joe took him for his word, for she coolly turned around and studied him, a proceeding which would have surprised him had he known it, for the worthy professor was very humble in his own conceit. She, one, can take criticism. Like, it's a very short passage, but she can take criticism and actually applies it because other, not only studying Shakespeare, but she then tries to study people that are around her and, you know, one of the more interesting ones she found, at least, was him, Professor Perry. So yeah, I don't know. I feel like it would have been if, if filmmakers decided to actually show what a good, at least as a, you know, friend at that moment, Joe finds Friedrich to be well enough to share her writings. I mean, personally for me, trying to share my process of writing is it kind of is a little intimate. Like I'm just like, uh, here. You, I trust you enough to, to read it and, you know, I'll take your criticism, but I, I, deep down I'm hoping you like it enough. <laughs> like, so, yeah, I feel like that other than like her family and Laurie, I think she's not spreading these stories around, like the ones that she truly feels are her best work. And, and I think that shows a lot of growth in Joe because she's kind of knows she's a little bit closed off at times and, that at this point she's showing that she can open herself to new people and and to trust to take criticism better than she may have done before. Which is I I, I think that was the moment for me in the two thousand nineteen film where I was just like, Oh, I'm gonna hate this when she gets mad at Friedrich. Again, he's just very calmly saying, you know, is share criticism and she's screaming at him and acts like a five-year-old, you're mean and I don't want to be your friend anymore. And I'm like, oh, no. Okay. Please. Oh, this is going to be bad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the prize story experience had seemed to open a way which might, after long traveling and much uphill work, led to this delightful chateau and esponge. Uh, sorry, that's not right. But, but the novel disaster quenched her courage for a time. Her public opinion is a giant which frightens short 
uh, stouter hearted Jack on um, bigger bean stocks than hers. Like that immortal hero, she reposed a while after the first attempt, which resulted in a tumble and the least lovely of the giant's treasures, if I remember rightly. But the up again and take another spirit was as strong in Joe as in Jack. So she scrambled up the shady side of this time and got more booty, but nearly left behind her what was far more precious than money bag. So here we have like but the novel disaster quenched her courage for a time. So this refers to her first book that was a flop. It's just like you said, she's kind of nervous to show those writings that she's very proud of. She's like preparing for the next big leap. But she's very frightened about it. About it. And it's interesting this part about public opinion. I am not a writer, but every time when you put out something creative, there is some kind of fear. Is it going to be a success or is it going to flop? Oh, yeah. I think, you know, for, for anyone from writers to artists, you know, even I know that some people that I follow make, like, gifts on Tumblr, they're worried that they're not going to get enough notes, particularly reblogs, because, like, they put in all that time and effort and they're really proud of it and it's like I did it so that way not only you, know, you can see how good I do this but to help share it with other people and it's like when nobody wants to share it it's like why do, why do I even try because you, you're trying to do it to connect maybe with people or to try to share with something that maybe you think another person feel the same. You know, I always think of Toni Morrison's book when she says that there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And I always think, like, well, I know that there's going to be somebody out there who's thinking of wanting the same story as the story that I'm thinking of. Like, there's always, there's got to be someone out there who thinks, I want a story that's like this, but they can't put their finger on it, and once it's out there, it's like, oh, this is something I always wanted to read. So, yeah, I, I think that wanting public opinion on one hand can be seen like, oh, little, like, you don't need to worry about what they think, but it's like, well, if you want this to be a career, you kind of want public opinion, but you also want to still maintain yourself, too, uh, which that can be a fine line to on it, so learns in this chapter. It's like when I was doing some of the episodes for this podcast and I made the one about Louis Meyerkopf and Germany and then Goethe, I didn't know if people liked them because I thought they might be a bit too academic for people, but then now they are like some of the most downloaded episodes, so I think alright, maybe it was a good thing <laughs> that I decided to <laughs> put them there, I was convinced that nobody was going to listen to them because I thought they were too too academic. Right. So I, I was wrong, and it's good. Yeah, you know, there's always something for everyone. I mean, that's, that's something I've come to sort of understand, like, just because maybe this portion of the population isn't interested in a story like this, that doesn't mean this other part of the population isn't. True. Like, I always just think of that moment in a Rocky Horror Picture Show when Janet is like, oh, I don't like my men, you know, tan and uh, muscular. And bring it further, like, well, I didn't make it for you. Like, <laughs> like when people are like, well, I don't really like this. Well, I didn't make it for you. I mean, for the people who would like this. So you cannot like it as much as you want. But I'm making this for the people who do want this. So, yeah, you gotta just... I, I try to keep that in mind whenever I write anything or put anything out there or participate in something that there's going to be someone who will like this. You know, there's always at least somebody out there. That is true. Then we are approaching to the weekly volcano. She took to writing sensation stories. For in those dark ages, even all perfect America read rubbish. 
she told to no one, but concocted a thrilling tale and boldly carried it herself to Mr. Dashwood, editor of the weekly volcano. She had never read Sartre Resartus, but she had a womanly instinct that clothes possess an influence more powerful over many than the word of character or the magic of manners. So she dressed herself in her best, and trying to persuade herself that she was neither excited nor nervous, bravely climbed two pairs of dark and dirty stairs to find herself in a disorderly room, a cloud of sicker smoke, and the presence of three gentlemen sitting with their heels rather higher than their hats which articles of dress none of them took the trouble to remove on her appearance. Somewhat daunted by this reception, Jo hesitated on the threshold, murmuring in much embarrassment, Excuse me, I was looking for the weekly volcano office. I wish to see Mr. Dashwood. These men are really rude because they don't take away their hats. <laughs> hey, they don't even do the bare minimum, like, even back then, men again makes me kind of angry how some movies portray Mr. Dashwood as some kind of a hero. He really doesn't have any respect for Joe. Yeah. Right here in the beginning. And I, and I just kind of think of um, I think it's the 94 version of one on Ryder one where the I presume it's him if I'm remembering it correctly but he doesn't even look at her papers just like has her little binder just tapping his cigar on it letting the ash fall and he's just like well we're not interested in fairy stories so go one of the women's magazines mm. and then doesn't even look at her when he says that last part he's just like hey go i'm paying attention to somebody else like so it's like why yeah why would anyone try to make dash would be this what a hero for helping to get Joe published when, when yeah, he just kind of dismisses her work. And, and in that one, in the, again, the 94 version, she has to lie and say Joe rather than Josephine, like, or Joseph. You know, she has to be like, oh, yeah, a man wrote this in order for her work to be taken seriously. Like if, it, if he was a true publisher who really was interested in good works, he wouldn't care who wrote it, just as long as the story was good. Obviously, as we learn in just a few short paragraphs, she doesn't even own up the stories herself. Down went the highest pair of heels, rose up the smokiest gentleman, and carefully cherishing his cigar between his fingers, he advanced with a nod and a countenance expressive of nothing but sleep. Feeling that she must get through the matter somehow, Joe produced her manuscript and, blushing redder and redder with each sentence, fluttered out fragments of the little speech carefully prepared for the occasion. A friend of mine desired me to offer a story, just an, ed, an experiment. Would like your opinion. Be glad to write more if this suits. When she blushed and wondered, Mr. Dashwood had taken the manuscript was turning over the leaves with a pair of rather dirty fingers and casting critical glances up and down the neat pages. Not a first attempt, I take it, observing the pages were numbered, covered only on one side, and not tied up with ribbon. Sure sign of an artist. No, sir, she had some experience and got a prize for a tale in the Blarmy Stone Banner. Oh, did she? And Mr. Dashwood gave Joe a quick look, which seemed to take note of everything she had on, from the bow in her bonnet to the buttons on her boots. 
Well, you can leave it if you like. We have more of this sort of thing on hand than we know what to do with at the present. Well, I'll run my eye over it and give you an answer next week. Now, Joe did not like to leave it, for Mr. Dashwood didn't suit her at all. But under the circumstances, there was nothing for her to do but bow and walk away, looking particularly tall and dignified, as she was apt to do when nettled or abashed. Just then she was both, for it was perfectly evident from the knowing glances exchanged among the gentlemen that her little fiction of my friend was considered a good joke, and a laugh produced by some inaudible remark of the editor as he closed the door, completed her discomfiture. Half resolving to never return, she went home and walked off her irritation by stitching pinafores vigorously. And in an hour or two, was cool enough to laugh over the scene and long for the next week. She really doesn't like this guy. <laughs> no. I heard it being like, right away, she just did not like him. She did the best that she could to just kind of walk out and feel a little, try to take some dignity with her. And, and that's always the worst, you know, when you know people are laughing at you. So I definitely know how much that can really hurt and make you angry. So I don't blame Joe because, you know, at least it's just something that she's trying to work on to be serious about. And the fact that they can't even accept the fact that maybe she is a little uncertain. Sure, your friend. Yes, we'll look at what your friend has written. They just immediately just kind of dismiss and laugh at her, you know, when she's barely out the door even. I like that in the 1994 film, because you can see that Jo is very insecure when she goes to meet Mr. Dashwood. One of the biggest problems that I had with the 2019 film was that it was trying to mix the two editors, Mr. Dashwood and then the actual editor of Louisa May Alcott, uh, Thomas Niles. And Thomas Niles was Louisa May Alcott's very close friend, and Mr. Dashwood, obviously, she did not like because... He's based on Frank Leslie, who was this media house owner in 19th century, and Louis and Alcott wrote those sensation stories for him. And Frank Leslie, he lived this very lavish lifestyle. I think I have a quote here somewhere about his work. This was a time when like, sensational press started to become more of a bigger deal. When Alcott was in her early 20s, she worked for New York magazine called Frank Leslie's Weekly Illustrated Newspaper. Weekly Illustrated Newspaper was part of Yellow Press. Newspapers were being sold with bias or emotional impressions rather than objective journalism. So it was not a very fact-based publication. I think nowadays we would might call that fake news. Yeah. Or something like that. Very biased and emotional way to suck people to read these stories and then spread disinformation. So if you work in this kind of magazine, I am not at all surprised that Louisa May Algo did have this internal battle, like what she's doing. Because obviously she needed the money. But then, like you said, she was the daughter of a preacher and Jo is the daughter of a preacher. She has very high morals, so... Yeah. Inner conflicts. Yeah, and... And, too, when you think about the time period, like... Nowadays, we're a little bit more... I don't want to say loose, because I don't think that's really true. I think we're... You could say maybe a little bit more liberal with thought, and we're now past the sort of thoughts of, like, oh, it's a... Like, if you're not Christian and you are, you're unworthy or you're not a good person, like, we're past, like, those kind of, like, very one sort of track minds, or at least we should be, like, we should be a little bit more open-minded. I guess that's really what I'm looking for. We're a little bit more open-minded. Um, but back then, they were a little bit more strict with their morals, with their beliefs, and, and that definitely, you know, comes with... I mean, the 
this is set in like the 1860s to like early 1870s or so, um, which is definitely Queen Victoria's time. And, you know, when you, when you notice like a little bit of history, the Victorian era was a very strict moral. Victoria took over because her style was definitely a lot more strict and covered and not as loose because the Regency era is got their inspiration from the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans. So that's your little fun fact of the day. So, but definitely when, you know, that's a set definitely at peak Victorian era, which was very more strict on morals and what is considered right and wrong. So, so it, it, it's not surprising, let's just say, even if Alcott doesn't have a preacher for her dad or even Joe too, they still live in a society where the idea of religion is a very important and strong factor of your daily life. Thank you so much for listening. Take care and make good choices. Bye.